Welcome everyone to a new episode, Space Connect Space Show, Causalities of Life. Today, we highlight the governance in outer space, launching the question of whether a reset of the international entities or organisms that have the mission to manage space is necessary. Uh, to quote the father of our space law, Mr. Gabriel Lafarandari, about space governments, governance, um, as always, I like to start the show with a uh, quote, the establishment of governance will only be politically realizable if we base it on a format inspired by a bunch of grapes, where there is a great supreme entity that represents the general interest bunch without taking away weight or legitimacy from the states that form it, the grapes. So it seems that the future lies in a model that integrates interest while respecting the identity of states. Managing with those that are active in space and ensuring that the benefits of space exploration and exploitation can reach all of humanity. I said at the beginning that it was a coincidence, but we're delighted that today's episode will be the curtain riser for the launch of Artemis, scheduled this evening at uh, 8.17 p.m. European time. Um, so welcome everyone to today's uh, space show, a new governance for new space, new actors, new scenarios. Without any further ado, I'll uh, hand the mic to our moderator from Singapore, uh, Gerardine Go Escola. She's a professor adjunct at the Faculty of Law at the National University of Singapore. So um, the mic is all yours. Thank you so much, Hien, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. I think my co-panelists and I are all very excited because we're on a party today, um, so we can celebrate Artemis tonight, I think. So it's one of those wonderful things that uh, serendipitously we bring together. I don't want to take too much time, so I'm just going to quite quickly introduce our very first speaker. She will give her keynote. Uh, and we're speaking then about Ms. Ruvimbo Samanga. She is a graduate in trade and investment law, currently specializing in space law and policy research for the African and global space sector. She has been recognized as a leader in several fields over several uh, different sectors as an African space leader, an emerging space leader, and a young space leader for her contributions in policy, business, education, and outreach. And she looks to collaborate on space-related capacity building research for the African and the global space sector. Now, today she'll open our discussions by having a wonderful presentation on public-private diplomacy, a new concept for space governance. And once we hear from Ravimbo, I will then introduce our distinguished panelists, of course. But Ravimbo, why don't you go right ahead and take us through your keynote? Thank you so much, Geraldine. It is such an honor to be here with my industry peers and also mentors. So without further ado, I'm excited to share my thoughts with you on public-private diplomacy, a new concept for space governance. The current geopolitical context is changing from one where over 90 governments are leveraging space products and services to an increasing reliance by government on the procurement of same from the tens of thousands of private sector corporations offering capabilities in launch, manufacture, assembly, testing, integration, and more. In fact, between 2008 and 2018 alone, over 600 private companies were established according to the CSIS. This collaboration, known commonly as public-private partnerships, signals a joint ambition to promote national interests. And according to a CSIS study conducted by fellow space lawyers Renata Como and Luke Riesbeck, the main national interests in establishing space programs can be split into six core nodes, namely for regulatory, geopolitical, centralization, coordination, socioeconomic, and economic purposes, with the latter, that is economic purposes, constituting the majority at 27.3%. For purposes of today's study, or discussion rather, 
I will focus mainly on the economic and geopolitical implications of new actor participation in space in the context of the space governance gaps that ensue. So to this end, both governmental and non-governmental entities will fall along one or more of these lines of interest and will inevitably form a diplomatic stance in the manner in which they execute said national strategy. And Africa is no different in this regard. With 19 space agencies and over 200 startups, the burgeoning industry is currently valued at 19 billion US dollars. And it is clear that public-private partnerships, as well as the concomitant international partnerships, have a geopolitical and economic role to play in supporting infrastructural development and regional integration as envisaged by the African Union's Outer Space Program. Beginning first with the economic implications. It is proposed by Dr. Tidian Oatara of the African Union that the core premise of engaging, particularly in Earth Observation Services, which represents Africa's largest space segment, is hinged on a desire for African stakeholders to secure three things, property, resources, and citizens. These all point to a predominant economic interest in engaging in space activity, that is, the securing of value of assets. It is also proposed that SpaceX's ambitions towards direct satellite to device services will have the potential to generate over 66 billion US dollars worth of revenue. And in light of a mere 40% internet penetration, this has an economic allure to African nation states in leveraging the digital access power of this new technology and in industry 4.0. To this end, the role of private sector cannot be negated as they bring the necessary innovation which makes space cost-effective and competitive, whilst government secures the civilian interest. Drawing from the Secure World Foundation's Handbook for New Space Actors, particularly the chapter written by Dr. Maslin Othman, it is concluded that governmental policy towards the private or commercial sector will have a significant impact on the business chances of these same private space venture examples I've given above, and thus requires some intentional legal intervention. Moving on to the role of geopolitical strategy. It cannot be understated as it is in fact an underlying and contentious factor for investment, particularly in emerging space nations. According to Gideon Gottel on behalf of the London School of Economics, bilateral partnerships in Africa have largely revolved around satellite manufacture and launch, with China paving the setting of norms in the use of bilateral comprehensive strategic partnerships, wherein the commissioning of a satellite mission is usually tied to the development or maintenance of another key infrastructure such as ports or railway systems. It should also be noted that six of Africa's satellites have been manufactured by China, most notably the case of Ethiopia's first Earth observation satellite, which was jointly developed by Chinese private corporation, Beijing Smart Satellite Technology. So we can begin to see that already in the non-spacefaring context and emerging space nations alike, there is an overlap in international public-private partnerships. And another interesting developing case study would be national collaborations with entities such as Viasat, collaborating with Zambia, and even SpaceX, which recently signed agreements with Mozambique and Nigeria for satellite broadband internet services which begs the question, how prepared are emerging states to engage international private sector diplomats, as it were? And with regards to this latter conception of private sector diplomats, invariably, these corporations become ambassadors of their nations, becoming synonymous with their national agendas and representing a form of quasi-diplomacy when engaging with international partners. And as a trade and investment specialist myself, 
It brings to mind a particular institution of interest to this discussion, and that is ICSID, otherwise known as the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, which is the leading institution devoted to international investment dispute settlement between contracting states and nationals of other contracting states. What this particular institution recognize, recognizes is the fact that disputes will always arise. That's a given. But there are particular instances where the parties to a dispute may not necessarily be congruent. That is to say, you may one day have an instance where a state has a dispute against a private investor or a corporation with varying jurisdictions and with a large economic asset at risk. Perhaps may soon be the case in the space domain as well with the increasing rise of offshore venture capital in Africa, which currently stands at 100% of the total sources of venture capital within the African industry. So what this background discussion has highlighted is that the role of both government and private sector is particularly complex and requires heightened, heightened forms of diplomacy as new actors continue to join the already melting pot of multi-stakeholder ambitions in space to include as well academia and institutions. But states have long honed, or at least it is hoped that they have, the art of diplomacy. So what would private diplomacy entail? According to Michelle Brecht on behalf of diplomacy.edu, companies undoubtedly have an impact on the perceived image of their countries abroad. So in creating policies, countries will also have to take into consideration means of unlocking the potential of this private sector impact in promoting said aims, as well as managing their activities. In the business environment, corporations are held to standards of corporate social responsibility. Therefore, it stands to be seen how these principles can be transmuted to a space context whether that be through the sustainability rating or the environmental, social, and governance principles. Such measures would lead to the defining of a new concept of space governance, which is space corporate diplomacy. And scholars from the Academy of Management have coined this phenomenon as an emerging concept in management, describing the corporate conduct that private sectors have to abide by when engaging in the international arena, particularly when it pertains to challenging and complex domains to which I think the space industry would fall. And just a little over 15 years since the first privately launched rocket was sent into outer space, little consensus has been reached on an international standard for managing diplomatic relationships between new space actors. This concept of corporate diplomacy I believe will have a strong role to play in future international relations, particularly in so far as it will manage the role that corporate entities will also have to play in winning the requisite support of external stakeholders, in particular, the community whom are directly affected by said activities. There are at least tens of thousands of private companies in the space of field, in the field of space technology focusing on everything from satellite launch, manufacture, engine technologies, provision of future space services and products that we have yet to even discover. However, it would be simplistic to say that the current regime does not encompass this development. In fact, Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty expressly provides that states shall bear international responsibility for national activity but yet more extension of this treaty provision can be done. Thus maintaining this corporate diplomacy is what will allow companies in future to continue to receive the requisite political will to exercise their rights and obligations within different jurisdictions, particularly with due regard to the effort that must be afforded, especially in beneficiating the benefits of space to non-spacefaring nations, as can be read from the preparatory works of the Outer Space Treaty. 
If this can be achieved, which is an internationally coordinated space governance system, acknowledging public and private interests in space, then we will achieve and usher in a new era of public-private diplomacy as a new norm. What public-private diplomacy will also recognize is that each state will invariably have its defining hallmark of space development along what I like to call the space development curve, which will require private sector support. I believe this curve is made up of three nodes. Firstly, research and development, which then moves on to technology development, and furthermore, to innovation and beyond. For example, the United Arab Emirates has launched the first ever Arab interplanetary mission to Mars. Luxembourg has also placed an emphasis on the utilization of space resources. And yet private corporations like SpaceX are focused on the use of satellite internet broadband across the world. Virgin Galactic is focusing on transporting space tourists to space along with its counterpart, Blue Origin. And my recent research with the Open Lunar Foundation focused on Africa's position to be a research and development base particularly for space resource utilization, drawing from its rich expertise as the extractive industries capital of the world and its immense history in managing multi-stakeholder interests. So as states develop their different missions in partnership with the private sector, they will likely be forced to collaborate with one another in order to meet varying needs and demands and essentially cross collaborate across resources and skills. To this end, managing these relationships, not only across state interests, but also private sector interests will be vital. This discussion cannot, however, be exhausted in this present moment. Therefore, in conclusion, I would like to close with a thought from Dr. Timiebi Aganaba, who surmises that space governance is something that should be looked at as a complex and adaptive system. And the most relevant areas we can look to towards in terms of development would be firstly, international space law. Secondly, international agreements and policy. Thirdly, national law and policy. And fourthly, other stakeholder interactions and standards as a starting point towards public-private diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravimbo, for that fantastic synthesis of what's happening in the sector today between public-private, track one and track two diplomacy, uh, and also for kind of so beautifully pulling in technology and, and what's happening in the actual space with space traffic governance and, and all this. Now, I, I, I have known Kaiuva and Stephen for many, many years. I can see they're both raring to go. So what I will do is just have the pleasure of introducing two people who don't need any introduction uh, and then let, it take, uh, let them take it away from there. So. Uh, for the audience, uh, we have Kaiuva Schrogel with us. He is the president of the International Institute of Space Law, which is the global non-governmental organization for space lawyers from more than 50 countries. He has served as chair of the legal subcommittee of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, UN COPUOS, which is the highest body of space lawmaking from 2014 to 2016. He is the Special Advisor for Political Affairs at the European Space Agency, ESA, and most recently has been editing with Edward Alga Publishing a book called A Research Agenda for Space Policy. Now, I can't do justice to Kaiuva CV just with that very short summary, uh, but that is Kaiuva Schrogel. And we also have with us Stephen Freeland, a very good friend. Uh, Stephen Freeland, of course, is Emeritus Professor at Western Sydney University and Professorial Fellow at Bond University. He holds so many visiting and adjunct positions at universities and institutes across the world, including in Copenhagen, Vienna, Toulouse, Hong Kong, Montreal, Kuala Lumpur, Vancouver, Mumbai, and London. He is a member of the Australian Space Agency's Advisory Board and has advised various governments on issues relating to national space legislative frameworks and policy. 
He represents the Australian government at UN COPUOS meetings and has been appointed by UN COPUOS as vice chair of a five-year working group on legal aspects of space resource activities. He is co-principal of the specialized space law firm Azimuth Advisory, a director of the International Institute of Space Law and a member of the Space Law Committee of the International Law Association. Um, with those introductions out of the way for our very famous panelists, Kayuba, do you want to maybe kind of jump in there uh, and give us your thoughts? on what space diplomacy is and, and what Rubimbo took us through. Oh yes, thank you. Thank you very much also for the kind introduction and happy to be here on the space show again. So um, I, I was fascinated by, by Rubimbo's uh, introduction. It, it was just great. And uh, there were so many ideas uh, uh, in it that, that it's really difficult to, to, to find a, a point to start with. Maybe I say a, a few words how amazed I am uh, by, by the African efforts uh, to, uh, to catch up, but also to come up with new creative and interesting ideas uh, on how to use space, um, what to do with space, how to uh, then also develop our uh, own capacities. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's really amazing. I, I, I now know so many people from Africa in the political field, uh, from the African Union, from the regions, but also, and, and even more, uh, the, the students, uh, the graduates uh, from the legal field, but also from the uh, technology field. And I must say, I, I'm amazed about, about uh, the creativity, the, the, the interest, and, and also the imagination uh, of, of, of these young people amongst uh, whom Rovimbo is, is, is one of the brightest, I, I, I should say. Um, Africa uh, will play a, a huge role. I'm, I'm absolutely uh, convinced. And, and not only as, uh, uh, as a continent using uh, uh, space, um, uh, space applications, uh, and you will use it in a, in a different way than, than we did. For example, how, how in Africa you develop uh, banking uh, uh, through mobile services, uh, which is a, a case study of its own, which is fantastic, and, and uh, which uh, provides also us in, in Europe and, and, and other places with, with very interesting insight of, of how you can go ahead. And so I expect a lot uh, from, from Africa coming up with, with also new ideas. Uh, uh, Stephen will, will share with me the impression that uh, diplomacy uh, has, has become a, a, a little bit uh, rusty, I must say. Um, you, you, you should not bash uh, UN corpus, you should not bash uh, the United Nations system and the way it works. But of course, it, it, there, there could be fresh wind. And um, we are people, even if we are a, a bit older, Stephen and I, uh, who, who try to promote that, uh, to, to, to really open doors and um, let, let's, let's just pass through these doors. Uh, Rubimbo, please uh, provide us with, with, your, uh, with your text. We will put it on the uh, IISL uh, uh, website if, if, uh, if you allow the, the hosts of, of, of that meeting. Now, um, let, let me come to, to the point uh, uh, you make um, uh, on diplomacy. Um, of course, we have new actors, we have new ideas, uh, new missions, uh, new dimensions also of space. But I would say we have old principles. And this old is not bad. And uh, this is something um, I would say with regard to space law, space law making, but also uh, the basis of space law, that even if we have almost everything new, we should consider that the old principles, which are already 50 years in place, should still guide our activities and our work. So these principles are non-appropriation of outer space, space as uh, common heritage or, or as it's called in in the uh, in the in the treaty the province of all mankind cooperation due regard uh, state responsibility uh, there are quite a few others uh, unfortunately only 
peaceful purposes, not uh, very clearly defined. But uh, we, we, we have also a principle, you quoted it, Govimbo, in Article 1, uh, that space benefits uh, shall be shared and uh, shall space shall be uh, beneficial for all countries and, and all societies, uh, regardless uh, their state of economic development. Now, what is dangerous is that um, we jump too much into the direction of uh, private business. Of course, private business is, is engaging. It's, it's also uh, moving things, uh, making uh, everything dynamic. But uh, we also have to see that if we would leave uh, also the governance of our field to business, I call it business, not uh, non-state actors, because I want also to be provocative, then the governance of space would look completely different. And in the end, I think I'm sure also, it would be detrimental to the interests of society, because we tend to have monopolies. And what monopolies do uh, to development and to equitableness and, and justice, um, you can see all over the place. Let's do not make the mistakes we did on Earth with a neoliberal way of handling things. Uh, it led us to a disaster, to the climate disaster. If we do the same in outer space, uh, outer space uh, will be monopolized by uh, commercial interests and it will not be the outer space as we have it now, where everybody has equitable access and uh, has the chance uh, to, uh, to benefit from outer space. Try, uh, and that's our task of today, help uh, to use the dynamism of private actors. Uh, don't block them, but uh, shape an environment, a legal and governance uh, environment, which actually helps to reape benefits from that for everybody. And uh, this is a little bit of an introduction, uh, uh, not a counterpoint to what Robimbo said, but uh, it is uh, an element uh, which we should consider when we enter the new phase of uh, uh, space governance, which, which certainly is there, but where I would uh, strongly advise to maintain the principles which can be said to be old, but which nevertheless are extremely useful, helpful, and beneficial. Thank you, Kai. I think old is gold, and we probably agree with you there. Um, but thank you so much for actually giving us that, that overview of the principles in the context of what's happening today. Um, I'm quite interested to hear what Stephen has to say, because of course, Stephen does a lot of advisory work as well with governments who are interested in protecting their international obligations while motivating also the, the new space industry in their various different markets. Uh, Stephen, what do you think? I mean, do you agree with Kaiuva? Um, obviously, we, we do very good work at the United Nations. How does that hold up uh, in relation to space diplomacy today? Oh, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Heen and uh, Rocio, thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's so lovely to be with Jerry and Kaiuva and Rubimbo. Thank you so much for your words. Um, as uh, as Jerry and uh, Kayuba have said, really inspirational. I mean, I've heard you speak before um, uh, on really important issues and promoting uh, the the African continent, um, and and you're a wonderful advocate. And and the ideas you raised today, as Kayuba said, are just so interesting. So. Uh, but it does promote some reaction, of course, uh, and and um, I must admit a lot of what uh, Kaiuva and he Kaiuva is a lot younger than I am. Um, he, uh, he is not old, but uh, I'm a Sputnik baby, so you can calculate very quickly how old I am. Um, but I do agree with Kaiuva uh, a lot uh, on, on what he said, and and I might reinforce some of that. So. There's absolutely no doubt. I mean, I, the first thing that I always say when I talk about space is <clears throat> it is so complex and there are so many different voices that are crucial 
if we are to get the governance of space on any issue correct. Um, so space is, of course, it's about diplomacy in the public sense. And as you say, Rubimbo, we in, perhaps also in the public private sense and the private sense and the corporate sense, but it's also about culture and it's about science and it's about exploration and it's about religion and it's about society. And of course, it's about military and national security. And of course, it's about economics, uh, which is, you know, very much a motivating factor for the private sector, um, as you said. So there is no one size fits all that e easily covers those different complexities of space in a way where we get true governance that is truly representative. But we have to make sure that as much as possible, those different voices are taken into account. Absolutely. So um, uh, space in the time since I was in nappies and Sputnik went up and immediately it gave rise to notions of uh, what is space from a legal perspective and how does that characterised and what are the obligations. Um, I would have I would say that and largely because of the fundamental principles that Kaiuba talked about, space has worked in those 65 years space has worked notwithstanding of course unbelievable development in technology unbelievable diversity in the range of actors and the breadth of actors not just countries but then as you said Rubimbo, in other form other types of actors we haven't had a war in space and there have been some very difficult geopolitical times as there is now, of course, but in that 65-year period. And space has given humanity such incredible advantages and benefits in so many ways. Every person on the planet, in my continent, in Europe, in North America, in South America, in Antarctica, in the Arctic, and in Africa and the Asia Pacific, every person on the planet is touched by space. Every person in the planet has had his or her or their life experiences and opportunities somehow touched, hopefully in a positive way, by space. So I agree with Kaiuva that the rules and the and the rules and the principles are not the only reason that that has happened, but they certainly are a powerful basis upon which that has happened. And so those rules and principles are incredibly important. They have served us well. They serve us well now. They will continue to serve us well in the future. Um, of course, those international rules and principles do not bind the private sector, but the international rules, and you made reference to Article 6, um, make it clear that as part of its obligation, a state has to assure that the activities of private non-governmental entities within, let's say, their jurisdiction are, let's say, in compliance with the letter and the spirit of the treaty. So already there's contemplation, the private sector is a part of it, but the private sector, as do states, need to ensure that what they do is in the furtherance of those fundamental principles. So what are the fundamental principles? Kyiv has made reference to most of them. And of course, some are contentious. But if you look at something that says um, space must be give rise to benefits for all, for all countries, irrespective of their economic situation and, and, and other situations, and then you look at the nature of, and, and when we now talk about the private sector, I'll focus on corporates. I, I, I'm a, in my previous life, I was an investment banker. So I know a little bit about what, the way corporates work, right? So I'll focus on corporates, but I recognize there are other types of non-governmental space actors. But if you look at, by and large, the psychology, the ideology of corporate, um, some of their goals, are not necessarily in entire sit in do not 
necessarily sit squarely with, if you like, those fundamental principles to which, in a sense, they are bound because the states have to assure that there are activities. And then when you have private, the private sector, for example, saying, well, we're going to do something and, you know, the law doesn't apply. We're going to create the law to fit in with our activity. And, and obviously no names mentioned, but you're all aware of the types of, uh, of statements that have been made by certain corporates. And of course, that's an extreme example, but it's, it's an example, as Kai Uber says, of the limits that we need to ensure still remain there so that, as you say, Rubimbo, this corporate social responsibility, the ESG, uh, that that corporates are now moving towards in very good ways, needs to be maintained and utilised. So uh, clearly the private sector has a lot to, to, to a big role. You know, the space sector was one of only three sectors that grew during the dark periods of the pandemic, the pharmaceuticals industry, the the digital industry, Netflix, you know, for obvious reasons, the space economy grew when the whole world was retracting. And that is largely because, not only, but largely because the private sector is being involved. But the private sector plays a major role in some countries and not as much in other countries. And so this is where I think the multilateral process is important in terms of governance. But and, and so I'll I'll talk about that for a minute, but I recognize at the same time that that multilateral process needs to be revved up, as Kaiuva says, you know, perhaps it's a little, it needs some changes. But this multilateral process is so important. So I, I look, for example, in the the example you mentioned of space resources, and obviously I, I won't make any statements on that given the role that I have at the un, in the working group. However, however, it's important. That is one of the big issues in space, you know, um, and the danger on any of these big issues is that if you don't have the, that multilateral agreement, let's say, on the quote unquote rules of the road in any of those big issues, it could be resource exploitation, it could be the way we manage debris, it could be on on uh, on orbit servicing, it could be uh, small satellite technology, it could be space situational awareness, it could be a whole range of things. But if you don't have that multilateral agreement, if you have different groups of countries and working with their own domestic corporates, operating at different rules, then you run the risk of the dangers that the non-appropriation principle that Kai Uwe mentioned, which was there really to help stop this idea of conflict, you know, stop it before it starts so we don't have these territorial claims, the, these claims over areas. We run a danger if different groups start working to different agendas because of their different cultures. Some are much more neoliberal, as Kaiova says. Some, are, some have different political systems. We run a risk that if they work to those different agendas, we're going to have miscalculations, misunderstandings, and worse. And so we need to maintain that process. So that's, you know, that is a, if you like, a positive for the existing multilateral process. The quote unquote flip side negative of that is exactly as you've said. At the moment, that that is that the decisions are made by the states and it's up to them whether or not they choose to listen to the private sector within their jurisdiction and their views reflect those. And I'm not sure that happens all the time. And in fact, you know, some states are saying we don't want to involve the private sector in any of these discussions because decisions must be purely on an intergovernmental basis. And so what we need to do is change that way of thinking. The way of thinking is let's understand that in the end, we need to have an agreement at that multilateral level, but it has to be an incredibly informed agreement where we understand what is industry doing 
and what are the technological changes and what are the impacts culturally and socially and environmentally on acts done by any space actor. And all of those things need to be drip fed and more into the multilateral process. And I think you're already seeing that. I think you're seeing you know, in this along the sidelines, a lot of interaction, both drifting down, but also drifting up from civil society into that multilateral framework to try to make the decision making more informed. We've got a lot more work to be done, but I think it's a it's a really fascinating idea to, if you like, more formalize that role of the non-governmental sector. Um, I think Many states will resist that. That's not necessarily, that doesn't say that they're right. But I think what we do is if we, as we bring it along, as Kayuba said, we must not, and I know you're not advocating this, we must not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, we must adhere to these principles that have made space by and large work, even though there are many, many challenges. And we're seeing those challenges in national law. So more and more companies having national law, they have obligations to implement. They are bound by all of these incredibly important principles. Virtually every country is a good space citizen in, in implementing their obligations. But on the other hand, they want to encourage entrepreneurship and industry. And so they've got to find a balance between these two. And sometimes it's quite difficult. And you look at different, you know, I've had the honour of helping many governments do their national laws, and you see they're very different in the way they deal with that. Um, so we've got a lot to learn from people like you, Rubimbo, who can quite clearly say to us what the issues are from that private perspective, because I think a lot of regulators, diplomats, government officials, representatives of COPOLIS don't really understand that. So I'll leave it at that. But I thank you again for really inspiring us with a really excellent presentation. Thanks so much, Jerry. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I'm actually really quite curious to hear what Rubimbo has to say now, because um, obviously, I think just hearing Kaiuva and, and Stephen, the big overarching question that I have in my head is, what is the point? So what does the law bring? Um, to all of this conversation? What is the role of the law? Why do we have these principles, which as Kaiwa and Stephen both have said, are important framework ideas that we want to keep in place? Um, we, if we think about space law, it's actually pretty forward looking, right? In the 50s and 60s, um, when other things were happening to have principles like due regard, to have principles that you know have things for the common benefit of all of mankind, all of humanity. Um, and what I'm seeing and that I'm very much enjoying is the initiative and the impetus from the African continent to hold these principles up, um, even while actually progressing in, in commercial space and, and really trying to move industry and motivate R&D and innovation technology. So I, I think that's the question which I have. Um, when we talk about space and diplomacy and international law, they seem so far away and so far removed from individual lives and so on. And that really isn't quite true. I, I think like, you know, that there is quite a, a very nice uh, interplay between the two. Ravimba, what do you think? I mean, I think it's really important that the voice of youth and Africa, of course, the youngest continent, uh, the one fastest growing as well. Um, would you like to respond perhaps to the overarching ideas that Kaiova and Stephen have put forward? Yes, of course, and I'm so privileged to be a part of this discussion because I think um, intergenerational dialogue is really what will allow us to create synergies between the interests, of course, of the forebearers, but also of the future beneficiaries of outer space. So I really appreciate the feedback that I've received as well. And on the question of the role of space law, I think one uh, principle that was really shoved down our throats in legal school was that the law is really there to provide certainty, and that is to allow stakeholders to make informed decisions, to understand the bounds of their actions, and to also understand the consequences of their actions as well. And if we're to look as well, maybe at a more formal definition of diplomacy, I have here from Stephen Glenshi, that diplomacy is essentially the art of managing relationships between two or more parties. And I believe that law, and in this context, space law, is the foundation upon which we manage those relationships. 
And this will usually take the form of structured communications, for instance, the multilateral systems that have been proposed by my colleagues, whether at UN Copius or the United Nations. And this art of negotiation has existed perhaps as long as civilization itself, from the time where our forebearers had to discuss where they could find food or resources or how their territory looked. And diplomacy in the strict sense is, is such an important concept in the context of space law, so much so that we have to delineate it not only from just space law itself, but also foreign policy. So I take foreign policy to constitute of, um, I suppose, the actions combined with the strategy by which a nation implements its agenda. And thus diplomacy would be, in essence, that act of actually uh, representing a nation's interest through these various communications. But in order to provide that certainty, and as my colleagues mentioned, there needs to be a standardization of the way in which we go about that. So that is where space law becomes very interesting, but there are some forebearers who are making some good headway for us in that regard. I'll draw on the likes of Dr. Benjamin Ellis Schmidt, who is a research associate at the Harvard Smithsonian Center. And he basically uh, surmises that space diplomacy ensures that these channels are kept open to rapidly address acute space incidents or challenges. And he also proposes a concept where we um, have anticipatory space diplomacy, whereby we anticipate future ch challenges and we create channels for communication so that we can have a fast uh, uh, re dispute resolution process. And I really like how uh, Kai Uwe and Stephen have mentioned that there does need to be fresh wind in this multilateral process because the reliance on, you know, um, private sector norms or on non-binding instruments or on bilateral agreements is sometimes this multilateral process can be a little bit tedious, bureaucratic, sometimes slow, and sometimes also not all encompassing of the interests of all nations. For instance, if you consider that the UN, Sec uh, the UN Security Council does not have an African representative, you then tend to wonder if all interests are in fact being considered. So once again, uh, going back to your question, space law is really just about equaling the playing field uh, by allowing all stakeholders to have a voice, to be certain on expectations, and uh, of course, to make sure that these expectations are widely known and adhered to. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Rabimbo. It's absolutely inspiring to hear you say that um, and also to bring in the, the questions of diplomacy. Now, actually, a really good pivot onto the questions which I think would be quite interesting to hear from all three of you. Um, and it's actually more of a twofold question. The, the first one being, of course, with the plurilateral rather than multilateral, but a very plurilateral way of looking at diplomacy today, given the various different incidents in North Asia, for example, on the borders of Europe. Um, I think two questions there. One, how does the COPIOS agenda become sensitive to the role of private sector in space? So how do we incorporate something like this in an international plurilateral or multilateral complex? And secondly, there is something that of course needs to be brought up, which is the national security interests of countries. Uh, and the whole defense and military complex, which is an, well, it's a part of, of space. We know that even in commercial corporate space, we're talking about a 60 to 70% of that sector, which is linked in some way or another to the military and defense complex. Uh, I'm just wondering whether uh, any one of you, perhaps let's go to Stephen first, um, would like to address either one of those, just from Copius's point of view, what new space can do uh, and the links perhaps with the uh, military strategy and, uh, and, and the, the defense complex. Yes, thank you, Jerry, and thank you also, Rubimbo, for uh, reminding us, which is important, of the role that law should be playing. And uh, as you say, sometimes uh, um, it 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 doesn't seem to be playing all of those roles in a, in the most effective way. Um, so the COPOS one and the private sector is is um, is a interesting question you know my my observations of copos over the 10 years i've been going and and, and kaiuva has incredible experience there as well um is that uh notwithstanding the criticisms of it sometimes being um you know about talking and not very much action is that i think it is becoming much more pragmatic you know if, in relative terms it's still a large bureaucratic organization 
but it's growing. You know, when I started going in 2010, I think there were 60, I can't remember exactly, 60, 65 member states. We now have over 100. If you look at the diversity of the member states, um, you know, all continents are represented in, in very significant ways. Uh, the African continent um, has a strong voice and does exercise that voice um, uh, in, in those discussions. So uh, I think COMPOS, I think the discussions have become more uh, uh, focused, have become, uh, if you like, more pragmatic, but we still have a long way to go. And and we're finding, as I said in my previous remarks, this resist, there is a resistance amongst some for that freshening up, as Rubindo says, of, of the process. So um, in, in the process that I'm involved with our, with our working group, for example, um, we've had a lot of discussion about, well, we can't even begin to come up with any answers until we understand the questions. To understand the questions, we really need to understand what the private sector, because a lot of the activities will be driven by private sector technology, either working with government, probably working with, but even if not. And, and we need to understand the, the questions before we can come up with any idea. So we need input, but, you know, significant input and information from the private sector. And we've had to navigate quite a, quite a, quite a walking on, on eggshells path to allow that to happen because many member states are saying this is an intergovernmental process, you know, that old school thinking. I'm not saying it is a critical way, but the thinking that has been there, that it's only states in the end that will make these decisions and we can't let other voices necessarily, you know, have too much of a say in, in, in those decision-making processes. But we found ways and are finding ways of allowing inputs into that process from the academic sector, from the industrial sector, from the civil society sector. Um, as I said, that is happening behind the scenes, but we're also going to have conferences and workshops and things like that, which will allow for those voices. So I think it's happening slowly. We're not going to get to the point anytime soon where COPOS resembles, for example, the ITU, where you've got a lot of, um, you know, non-governmental, if you like, pseudo-members to the ITU as well as 193 countries. I think that, you know, we should move that way, but I think there's a lot of time. Reform of the UN, and you mentioned the Security Council, well, you know, it's not going to happen in my lifetime in a significant way, I don't think, although one could. So, but I think it is happening, but slowly, and we need voices like yours to continue to push that. On the national security, it's such a crucial issue. In my country, for example, um, the, in Australia, the, there's a lot of money now being, being designated to space, much more than ever before. And as you say, Jerry, quite rightly, the vast majority of that is defence related. You know, in Australia and in, I'm sure in many other countries, it's all about the development of sovereign capability. It's all about the development of reacting to the geopolitical changes that Rubimbo talked about. Also in our region, the Asia Pacific region, as well as everything else that is happening. And that then raises very difficult issues because for, for a corporate who um, wants to be involved and quote unquote make money, in the space sector, they will have to work on, you know, their biggest client will often be defence. And that will involve them in, a, in developing technologies that, um, that may ultimately, if they're used in the wrong way, and I'm not suggesting they would be, but if they're used in the wrong way, will challenge law, will challenge the ethical the moral, the legal framework upon which space stands. And so I think it's important there also for, you know, the industrial complex to have a role in the way they work with government, in the way they work with defence, in the way they work on national security, to find a way to, if you like, 
ensure that other voices, other concepts are taken into account as this technology gets developed. But it's really hard, right? If I'm a young startup and I have the possibility of getting a multi-million dollar contract with defence to build missiles, you know, or, or whatever, that's very tempting for me, of course, for my company to survive. Um, but I think it's a two-way street. You know, I think um, industry has a lot to gain from working with big court clients, even defence, because it will help them develop technology and and which could be used for a whole range of purposes. But I think defence has a lot to learn from the private sector also about their role in space, about the need for, as you said at the beginning, its sustainability, the need to ensure that we just don't cross lines that um, that we can't afford to cross because that would make things bad. So, uh, you know, I think the industry has an important role to play even there in the shaping of that policy in the shaping of ideas of not thinking of space, for example, as a war fighting domain or whatever. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Stephen. Kyle, do you agree? What do you think? Well, Gary, now I know why I don't like to speak after Stephen, because I do not have much to add. Um, I, I can just uh, elaborate on, on, on one point you made, and, and this is ITU. Uh, I also often use uh, the example of ITU, the governance of ITU, uh, as a good example uh, for space as well uh, to develop. Uh, because you're in Corpus, you have the government. Fine, uh, that's okay. And uh, that's also diplomacy in the strict sense, which is uh, the dialogue between nations. Uh, not between this and that, but between nations. Um, and uh, this is not enough anymore. Of course, this will be the only legitimate actor still uh, to make decisions uh, which are then binding. Um, but nevertheless, we have to take these decisions by governments much better uh, um, prepared and uh, in a much, uh, let's say, uh, a better organized way uh, as this is done uh, in particular in ITU. Uh, they have uh, uh, um, non-governmental industry actors uh, really integrated in their work, uh, in particular in the field of standardization. Uh, uh, non-governmental actors are also a part of all the big policy uh, debates and fora. Uh, and in UN corpus or in space law in general, we don't have that. Uh, some member states uh, have in their delegation um, uh, non-governmental uh, advisors or, or uh, delegates, uh, but uh, it's the government uh, which speaks. And in, amongst the observers, we also do not have uh, industry. Now, I would not go so far uh, to give uh, industry or, or these non-governmental uh, actors uh, a voice uh, equal to the ones of the governments? Certainly not. Uh, why? Uh, look what is happening with Starlink. Uh, Rubimbo, you pointed out uh, quite, uh, quite correctly that, that Starlink uh, uh, provides a lot of benefits uh, to uh, countries, uh, the societies, uh, rural areas, but, but also uh, other areas, uh, some, some, and a lot of countries benefit from it when they have natural disasters uh, where, where Starlink is quick uh, to come. But on the other hand, look into outer space. Is this sustainable uh, to put mega constellations uh, in outer space? Uh, the space debris also, uh, it's, it's, it's really... Um, uh, not clear whether you still can say that that everybody has equitable access uh, to uh, these areas of space or, or to these orbits. So uh, this is something where the government and Rubimbo, you again also uh, said uh, the the, uh, the the key uh, uh, element of of all this that the governments through national space legislation are the ones uh, which guarantee that the governance of outer space 
uh, and the use of outer space uh, can be conducted and will be conducted in a way uh, which is sustainable now and for the future. Now, has anybody on the international level or then in the US on the national level uh, done a lot of thinking uh, before licensing uh, Starlink, uh, the effects on the space environment? Well, I don't think so. Um, well, again, I, I, I don't want to, to be negative uh, against uh, mega constellations. They, they can bring a lot of advantage, but we have, or, or countries have um, authorized mega constellations and, and everybody is now rushing to do 10,000 satellites, 100,000 satellites and so on, without carefully considering what that means to the space environment. So this is the task then of space diplomacy and the only legitimate actor in that field, the governments, also through their national legislation. And another point I want to, to raise, uh, Rwimbo, which you mentioned, absolutely uh, uh, agreeing that uh, there will be more arbitration uh, to come. Uh, and arbitration amongst uh, the privates, the governments, and, and other actors. And uh, we are not prepared for that. Uh, this is the other field uh, where we have to come up uh, with something completely new because it does not exist and where we already from the beginning have to consider and have to build in uh, the new uh, system and, and, and the new developments uh, which you have been uh, presenting. So this is something in the making. Again, uh, we have to maintain the, the elements uh, which are beneficial for maintaining order and the rule of law in outer space um, to balance uh, the, the issues of uh, monopolies also, commercial monopolies and uh, the freedom of use for everybody and uh, also the sustainable uh, use. And uh, this, this will, uh, as, as Stephen also mentioned, uh, a task uh, which we only now start to understand and analyze and your generation's uh, task then to implement into governance schemes, be that space traffic management, be that something different uh, from that um, building on uh, what we have or revolutionizing uh, the, the whole governance uh, scheme in outer space, but, but always hopefully considering the principles which have worked so well and, and which should be maintained also in the future. Well, thank you, Kai, but that brings us beautifully, I think, close circle back to what Vimbo has said at the very beginning of, of, of this show. Um, and from there, I mean, Kai, I draw the huge principles of sustainability. What does that mean? How do we measure it? Do we have the orbital commons? Um, how do we protect the environment? All the ESG concerns that Ravimbo brought up to begin with. Uh, the question of transparency and confidence building, we talk about that a lot in space law, but today we're really looking at arbitration, dispute settlement, the use of all these mechanisms. And so I, I, if I might, I'll just turn right back to Ravimbo and I have a nice closed circle there. And that's a good question then. Do you think it would be possible to strike a balance between the commercialization of space when you consider also the defense complex um, as well as ethics, you know, so really forward looking, all these environmental concerns that Kaiuva brought up, uh, you know, trying to engage with uh, civil society and uh, commercial entities, as Stephen brought up. And all these wonderful points that you yourself uh, raised, Ruvimbo, uh, thinking about the environment, forward looking, um, you know, actually ensuring equitable access to outer space, not the first ones there can just put whatever they want up and not have to clean up after themselves. Ruvimbo, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you so much. I certainly do think that we can strike a balance between commercialization of ethics, um, sorry, between commercialization and ethics. And I'll, I'll do so by picking on one of the key developments in the space industry right now as it pertains to commercialization, which is space resource utilization. Um, and that's a current debate where uh, lunar resources, especially from what I draw from my research, 
um, require a reclaiming of sorts. And we reclaim these lunar resources in a commercial and also an ethical way through identifying space governance gaps. So going back to what my colleagues said about multilateral processes, I really do um, uh, subscribe to the values of polycentric governance, whereby we not only have that bottom up and top down approach, but we include all stakeholders in this uh, dialogue process. And I quite value as well, think tanks such as Open Luna Foundation or even uh, For All Moon Kind, which bring these different stakeholders together to identify these gaps. And we sort of then try to strike a balance or compromise according to the law. But going back to the example of lunar resources, um, I have an upcoming book chapter on reclaiming lunar resources in which I uh, quote Ian Crawford, who, whom I agree with rather, um, that the development of lunar resources in particular will require international legal intervention to fulfill three things. And the first thing he mentions is, firstly, we need the law to spur large scale investments in prospecting and extraction activities, which is what gives us that commercialization element. Secondly, he mentions that um, we need the law to manage geopolitical interests, which again gives us that ethics element because there's international relations involved. And then as a third addition, the sustainable equitable resource beneficiation, which I believe is a nice merging of the two commercialization and ethics, understanding that there is a desire to not only make money, but to make a value in a way that is beneficial to all parties. Um, and then I go on to presuppose that all of these different factors, whether it is investment, whether it is geopolitical interest, or whether it's benefit sharing, are all essentially extensions of property rights. And therefore, um, in these uh, intended benefits, as supposed by Ian, we cannot derive um, a lunar resource exploitation system without an equitable and comprehensive property rights regime. And this is an interesting space governance gap that we have in an in, in international context because humanity is pressing forward on its journey to the bounds of the universe and there's this pit stop at the moon um, and it's been determined that Earth's satellite has you know, vast mineral resource uh, capacity as well. But to this extent, we don't have property rights over the tangible and intangible benefits of space resources, but we've begun to have legal transfers and claims to material derived from the moon. For instance, NASA has signed a $25,001 contract to four companies to bring back moon rock. And we recently had this uh, fabulous agreement between Orbit Fab and the Open Lunar Foundation to donate lunar material. And that's a legal transfer, at least in the legal context, we will have to determine what is the nature of such a transfer or claim of ownership, whether we can even uh, claim it as ownership or possession in a different sense. So in managing these multi-stakeholder ambitions, we still need to understand that at the fundamentals of this field is the intersectionality between international law and in this current case study, international property law. And it requires us to consider how different parties will lay certain claims within permissible limits of the outer space treaties and the fundamental principles, as my colleagues mentioned in exercising that balance between commercialization and ethics. And at the core that just requires creative legal uh, or thought leadership, which is quite creative and which is quite um, all encompassing of different interests. And to that extent, um, I think if we can all sit together and brainstorm on these different gaps, looking at our terrestrial regimes and finding how we can transmute that to outer space, perhaps we can strike that balance. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you, Ravimbo. You bring up, of course, more and more interesting things for me to consider. Um, and I think perhaps two questions which just kind of rise to the forefront of what you just said. The first, of course, is, you know, we're looking at, for example, whether lunar or just basically extraterrestrial resource utilization and the question of, uh, you know, how we're going to manage that and how the governance framework for that will look like uh, if there will be one in the future. I suppose the first question I have is, do you think there is something that we can learn by analogy, perhaps, uh, from different systems, for example, the ones for the management of the high seas or the ones for the management of deep seabed? Um, and do you think there, there are things there, despite, for example, um, the Wellington Convention not actually coming into force, uh, the one for Antarctic resources? 
And the second question, which I, I think is actually quite important, when we talk about space loan diplomacy, a lot of people find that very distant. Um, and, you know, they're looking at the big complexes that we have. And I suppose the question for not just Ravimbo, but, but also Stephen and, and Kaiuva, um, is do you think that the people, you know, the, the next person on the street who look at the geopolitical issues that we are seeing on the daily basis today, who are you know, listening to the, news, uh, the newscasts every night and, and listening to all of that, do you think they would trust an international uh, body, one between countries, between states, to bring order, not just to the interests of their countries in space, but for the actual equitable benefit of every one of us of humanity? Um, I don't mean to put Ravimba on the spot. I don't know if you want to go first. And then this time I'll let Kaiuba go before Stephen so that then Stephen can follow Kaiuba for the first time in, in this talk. Um, but yes, Ravimba, do you have any thoughts on those two questions? So the first one, the analogy with other uh, systems like the high seas, the deep sea bed, and the second one on the matter of trust uh, between regular people uh, on the streets and an international body that seems so removed. Certainly, I have read from a scholarship that really we, we need to take space law as a form of international or public international law to the extent that we're dealing with an international domain or a global commons. And those rules can very much have application according to different contexts. And one example that comes to mind, perhaps in the context of space debris is the concept of salvage, which comes from the, the law of the seas, which is whereby a state has an opportunity to clear any wreckage from ships or any other marine equipment and receive compensation for that in the interests of you know, the equitable use and access for all other entities. And I like to think of it in the context of space debris whereby at some point we might have a mechanism one day where um, private corporations or even state agencies will have an opportunity to not only contribute to sustainability in outer space, but also derive benefit from it, not only from the compensation they receive for their intellectual property and their technical capacity, but also perhaps even the value of repurposing these different space systems that they'll uh, have a hold of. So this is a principle that I think would find useful application in outer space and in incentivizing this good behavior or a good governance system for space debris mitigation in outer space. And with regards to your second question, whether I believe the political will uh, supports these international organizations, um, I'll be a little bit skeptical and be the devil's advocate and say, if we have regard to the current systems and how they sort of have fared in, in international scenarios, there can be some skepticism, especially owing to the fact that um, undoubtedly, when you have so many interests, uh, over 193 countries in the world, there's bound to be some compromise. And unfortunately, the jurisprudence will show that a lot of the compromise will come from the so-called weaker states or the non-spacefaring states or the developing countries, etc., who might not necessarily always have a voice. But um, over and above not having a voice sometimes may not have the technical capacity or the know-how to even engage in the subject matter as well. So there is a, a lot of reckoning to be done in terms of bringing, I think, uh, everyone up to the same rung of the ladder in order to be able to create an organization that is fair and equitable across all diverse intersectionalities, whether that be gender, whether that be by country demographic, et cetera, or even age. Um, but I certainly think that there have been good models. For example, the European uh, Union as a multilateral system has succeeded very well. Uh, again, considering that it is uh, only 28 countries, but it still fulfills, fulfills that same purpose. So I suppose um, the subsidiarity principle would apply whereby perhaps we can have a situation where the multilateral system begins at a continental level or perhaps a regional level, and that feeds into a broader polycentric form of governance that then encompasses all of those different um, and larger voices all together. Thank you, Ravimbo. Kaova, I'm not sure I've done you any sort of favors now by having you speak after Ravimbo, but uh, would you like to add perhaps to that? Oh, I, I, I love to do that uh, because I want to play the angels uh, advocate. Uh, <laughs> so uh, saying um, uh, trust in an international uh, organization or orga organizational setup. What else? What else? Would you entrust it uh, to these countries, uh, a country which is invading uh, other countries, uh, um, uh, 
telling people uh, that they will let drop a space station uh, on Earth? Uh, excuse me. Uh, there only can be a, a, a trust in an international, multilateral, universal uh, setup. Uh, only this is legitimate. And it's also not a kind of benign hegemony by, by a friendly uh, uh, superpower, uh, which shall make the rules uh, and then the others follow. No, it's multilateralism. And, and Stephen is actually currently working exactly uh, on that to, to have a multilateral setup to create new norms, principles, certainly not the treaty, but nevertheless, something which is then based on the broadest legitimacy possible. And this we must fight for. And I, 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 I want to be even more provocative. Um, and, and this is that we, we, we don't draw any lessons from what we are doing on Earth. Uh, we continue to destroy the envi environment. Uh, we take excuses now that there is war and, and um, that, that we, we in Europe might turn down for one degree uh, our, our heatings uh, because we don't get any gas anymore. Um, well, we also have to understand that um, we are facing the really big disaster with climate change. And we have to understand that we have to also say no to something, what we could do, but we just don't do it. And amongst such things like having big SUVs, uh, everybody, um, we also have to sometimes say when it comes to technology development and uh, to the exploitation of something, on Earth or in outer space, to say, no, we don't do that, even if we can do it. Let's first consider, make a moratorium, and, and then say, shall we do it? What will be the consequences? Will it be just for a few, uh, the first come, first served, uh, they get rich, the others get poorer? Uh, we. We haven't really discussed that. Of course, everybody is fascinated. I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated uh, by the idea of space mining, resources, uh, um, um, humans on the, back on the moon, maybe on the Mars. But we have to carefully consider what the consequences are. Uh, take another example on Earth, geoengineering. Uh, it will come. It will absolutely certainly come. But I'm afraid it will come before we have thoroughly considered it. Considered it also on a multilateral level, on a multi-level uh, uh, also uh, bringing in the society. So we have so much more work preliminary or, or uh, work to do, uh, which will prepare us for such uh, decisions and and. Actually, we are rushing into something. We are destroying what we have achieved also in, in the mindsets and, and in the legal uh, system of, uh, um, of, of the global commons uh, that, that I'm uh, honestly a little bit scared uh, of, of what is, is currently uh, going on. And I must also say um, that that's not against you, Rovimbo, um, that the younger generation is a little bit Ah, yeah, good. Uh, global common and uh, outer space treaty and so on, non appropriation. Ah, okay. But uh, let's do something. Uh, we have to do a bit away with, with these principles, but, but it will be good and, and it will work out. I must say, uh, Stephen and I have a little bit more experience, a few decades uh, of, of experience, how such things uh, work out. I, I would be more happy to transfer the principles of, uh, of the commons to what we are doing on Earth, uh, uh, instead the other way around, um, taking away uh, uh, and doing away with the principles of the global commons in favor of, of how we have uh, been doing and yeah, well, how we have, we have been destroying the Earth.
Thank you. I, I love it when Kaiwa says he's being provocative and basically all he does is make me think of some more questions. <laughs> but uh, thank you for that, Kaiwa. I'm, I'm, well, Stephen, would you like to react to that? Yes, yes, I would. And, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll be as quick as I can. Um, so we started off this discussion, this wonderful discussion with Ravimbo's paper about, well, we need to rethink about governance. There are many challenges. There are many actors. Let's you know, perhaps consider ways that we can have a better way of of looking, and that might involve other actors, other in in, in more formalized governance structures. In the end, you know, I, I, nobody disagrees with that. Um, what I want, what you want, what Kayuva, Jerry, Rocio, Heen, everybody involved in the space is we want to find the right governance structure, um, and and. I have in my own mind three golden rules of governance that we need to think about for space in the future. And whether or not we can get state actors to subscribe to these, whether or not we can get private actors to subscribe to these, because they have different agendas as well, is really the, the challenge. But we've got to go there. Firstly, we all have a common interest states, private sector corporations we all have a common interest in not screwing it up you know Kyuva said we and you know we have completely screwed up what we've done on earth let's for heaven's sake pardon the pun not translate those same those same mistakes into space we have a common interest because if we get it wrong then we all suffer like climate change we're suffering we will all suffer Maybe who suffers the most will, is different depending on, but but we all suffer, likewise with space. So any governance structure should reflect this notion of understanding that we have a common interest. And civil society and the private sector have a very, very strong role in ensuring that states, as Kaiva said, don't look in a nationalistic way when they authorise or when they do things, but they look at this common interest. Okay, we're all in this together, notwithstanding that how difficult life is at the moment. But a lot of that, uh, when it comes to space, is chest beating because I think deep down inside that common interest is a powerful thing. The second, the second thing is humanity. We've all touched on this. Space is about human rights. Space is about how humanity exists. Space is about the future of humanity. It's about remember your generation and your children's generation, etc. Space has this capacity to do so much for humanity, and we have to ensure that this intergenerational, which is indeed reflected in the Moon Agreement, this intergenerational notion, because again, if we screw it up, we screw it up for humanity. The future of humankind is dependent upon space. And the third thing is, and Kaiuba so eloquently talked about it, we are custodians of space. You talk about property rights. I was today uh, in my country at a, at a, it's called a smoking ceremony, where our Indigenous people um, welcome you to their country and you embrace. And they were talking about, because um, we went out to country, uh, they were talking about the relationship that they see with, with the earth. Our Indigenous people do not have ownership rights, property rights. In fact, it's the other way around. They belong to the earth and they're here as custodians for future generations. Right? We are custodians of earth. We're doing a bad job. We are custodians of at least that space that we have some semblance of activity in at the moment. And so if you, you, we can find the structure that takes into account those three, for me, golden rules. Firstly, we should all get the Nobel Peace Prize. But secondly, you know, that is, you know, to try to allay the fears that Kayuba has. The private sector, the civil society has an incredibly strong role to play. And, and your voice and the voice of many like you, and that's not meant patronising, I mean it sincerely, is so important. But we must adhere to those three notions and not necessarily, as Kayuba said, not necessarily say, because we can do it, let's do it. If we can do 500 things in space, we need to start thinking about, well, which of the 300 we should be doing? 
you know, or, you know, the numbers are irrelevant, but you get the idea. So I'll leave it with that. I'm sorry if I've, I've taken us too late, but thank you again to everybody for inspiring us for this, I think, excellent conversation. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Stephen, and also to our panelists. I think that's a wonderful high note to end on. We are children of the cosmos. Um, and really not just, you know, taking care of this planet, which, which is the only one we have, and we haven't found another one that we can have as a, as a planet B, um, but also this cosmos and our little insignificant, you know, pieces of, of where we are in such a huge, vast infinity. Uh, I've had a wonderful time today. Um, and I thank, of course, Hien and her team, including uh, Rocio and I think Yara somewhere in the background uh, for organizing this. But a wonderful thanks to the amazing panelists, uh, Ruben Busamanga, Kai Vishrogal and Stephen Freeland. It's so nice to be among friends and to talk about things that move us so much and which impact on us every day. Hien, I'm going to give it back to you, but uh, thank you so much for joining us um, and joining me today. I had uh, such a mind-blowing experience. I'm going to spend the rest of the, of the weekend just thinking on all the questions that you all brought up. Hien, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jara Din, uh, for uh, this amazing moderation. And uh, Kai Uwe uh, uh to always be there holding space for women so kindly and Stephen and of course uh, Uvimbo, uh our Unusa mentor. Thank you so much. There's nothing I can add on. It's a lot of information for me as a layman to take space policy. I hope it all serves everyone um, watching. Thank you for the, your participation. And uh, a special thank you for my dear friend, uh, Rothio. Um, uh, she uh, she, she co-curated this episode and co-organized it. Uh, she's an expert in our space law and policy, as many of you know. Um, we invite you, well, uh, jo uh, enjoy the Artemis this evening. Hopefully it goes successfully for everyone. And uh, we see everyone back next month month for the World Space Week. Um, I think we have something for space and sus sustainability uh, surprises um, by children. So this episode would also be available um, for all space and policy schools. So feel free to share and subscribe to all future Space Connects episodes. Thank you everyone for your attention. <laughs>